Welcome to Face to Face, and today we're going to go to Germany. We're going to talk about uh, the economical situation of the bank collapse in the US and the need to reform uh, this bank um, economical system. So I'm with Elga Ziblarush, who is the, the window of uh, um, the founder of Larush International Organization and the Schiller Institute. Welcome to Face to Face, Ega. Hello. 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 So, do you want me to add anything about uh, yourself before we, we go into the, the bank situation? No, unless you have a specific question. No, I have no specific <laughs> question. <laughs> so, we publish your call um, a few days ago about the need to reorganize the banking system. But before we go to that uh, uh, to that proposal, can you describe a little bit how do you see the present moment between the the, the, the Silicon Valley Bank uh, who got under the signature bank who go under uh, the the fact that you have no CEO has been arrested, then you have bonus who have been paid, then you have stock who have been sold before, and people who have made millions and uh, uh, people who have lost everything or most of everything. It doesn't look like corruption to you? Well, I think, you know, this is the um, final stage of a system which is uh, hopelessly bankrupt. It was already bankrupt in 2007. Uh, <clears throat> my late husband, Lyndon LaRouche, made a very famous video statement on the 25th, uh, 2007 of July. Uh, where he said this system is hopelessly bankrupt and all you can uh, see is how the symptoms will come to the surface. And since they did not correct anything, it came to the collapse in 2008. This was a systemic collapse and the central banks did not correct any of the root causes. Uh, instead, they went into trillions and trillions of money pumping, quantitative easing, zero interest rate, even negative interest rate, and this has now reached a point where, because of a combination of factors, uh, you know, we are between the Skiller and Charybdis. You know, if the central banks are trying to fight inflation and go for a rapid interest rate hike, you have such results like Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse and all of these things. And if they let go, we end up in a hyperinflation. So there is no solution within the system. And the main problem is not just the over indebtedness of the system, which you know is the result of all of this, uh, you know, money into speculation and not into the real economy. But the real problem is the gigantic derivative bubble of uh, estimated uh, two quadrillion dollar worth of the outstanding derivative. And the problem with Credit Suisse is <clears throat> that all the counterparty banks of Credit Suisse are the U.S. banks. So therefore, you know, there is complete panic. They're obviously trying to find something over the weekend to get the UBS bank to take exactly. over. Exactly, merge. The... Yeah. yeah. So what, what is your take on, on the merging? Well, you know, obviously UBS bank doesn't want to take a lot of uh, <clears throat> junk. So it may end up in that the Swiss uh, central bank will take over uh, but this is short-lived, you know. I mean, this is, in a certain sense, you know, uh, as I said in my in my statement, you know, there is only the chance that either you have a chain reaction collapse, uh, like what Bill Cross uh, described uh, some years ago as a supernova, where the entire financial system could evaporate. Uh, the image used as a domino effect is wrong because it's not just one domino you know, kicking over the, the next one. Uh, well, so it's either this collapse or, you know, you have a hyperinflation. In any case, this is extremely dangerous and it will hurt a lot of people. It will hurt not only people who lose their life savings if there's a hyperinflation, uh, but the key problem will be the developing countries. You know, the global south is, uh, is the most in danger because they are the most vulnerable. And that is why I have called uh, for such an emergency summit, because I think, you know, if the governments only try to, you know, 
somehow make a cosmetic solution as they did 2008 and in the 15 years since it cannot work and since i'm since a long time convinced that the real danger of world war comes from the fact that the western neoliberal system is bankrupt and therefore from that standpoint they see the rise of china and other asian countries as a mortal threat so we have to urgently get out of this geometry and uh, you know i think that the danger to mankind is gigantic so but at the same time i see it's an opportunity it's finally things are collapsing and we can open the door to a new to new proposal to to transform the way we are seeing the world and seeing the countries and seeing the the part of the economical system into into the humanity's future uh, yes there is reason for optimism but you know i want to really say it will not come by itself it requires action uh, because of the weaponization of the dollar, um, you know, a lot of countries, not only Russia, China, but also many countries of the global south, are moving towards the creation of a new international currency, which is based on completely different criteria, <clears throat> namely, uh, you know, hard commodities, uh, bringing in back stability into the uh, currency and into a potential credit system. The problem is they are not yet quite there. Uh, and, you know, given the fact that, you know, there are many obstacles from the past, like Russia still has uh, the problem with the sanctions, uh, other countries' uh, currencies are not convertible. So technical problems have to be uh, overcome. And But I think the crisis may force the countries of uh, the BRICS plus I mean, this is the BRICS plus 24 countries who have applied for membership. Um, you have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Eurasian Economic Union, the African Union, potentially ASEAN. All of these countries may be forced to speed up the effort to put a reorganization of the system on the table much quicker than they had planned. Uh, unfortunately, I do not see any willingness in the Western countries. Uh, there has been here and there some discussion about the uh, reintroduction of class steagall banking separation, but that would really require a concerted action uh, of Europe and the United States and Japan. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't see that they are going in this direction, at least not at this point. Do you think they're going to have any choice at this point? I mean, I agree with you with a little bit early, but uh, uh, something is there. It it's need to grow, it needs to be uh, developed, but things are not like 50 years ago where it was nothing existing. So, um, and does, does really Europe and, and, and the US have any choice to, to not uh, transform their uh, point of view and mentality and, and, and click into something larger? Uh, that is the 64 billion or trillion <laughs> dollar <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, I mean, if, if they would be reasonable. I mean, look, we are in a in a world danger which does not need to be there. I mean, I know. since, uh, you know, if when, when Xi Jinping announced the uh, Silk Road in 2013 in Kazakhstan, and then, you know, China started to develop the Belt and Road Initiative. It, it started to grow. In the beginning, uh, China said a million times, and I was in the middle of it because we, you know, we had a big part in developing some of the theoretical conceptions which became the new Silk Road. Um, <clears throat> you know, Xi Jinping offered many times to the United States to cooperate, to yeah. the Europeans to cooperate. Yeah. So in a certain sense, the decision to, take, to turn China into an adversary was entirely made by the West. It I was know. nothing but what China did. I know, I did a book on it. <laughs> it's called The White oh. West. <laughs> so, right. um, so, yeah, but, but I think they are, I mean, I think they are corner. I, 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 I agree totally to your, uh, to your analysis and, and thank you so much for, for helping to, to shape this new uh, direction. 
and and but I don't think um, it at in in the short middle term uh, the the things have to go have to be transformed. It's it's and 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 I welcome the collapse of uh, of the bank. Yeah, the problem is the arrogance of the Western establishments. I mean, they should you know if they would have any sense, they should go into their uh, study, their living room, their bedroom, whatever close the window and start to think and then say, okay, we made a mistake. Uh, we pushed a system whereby the billionaires become more billionaires, the millionaires become more, but the billions of people become poorer and poorer. And that is a wrong idea. I mean, the, the very idea that you have a small class of people who become so perversely rich that they never can spend the money in their lifetime, but you have billions of people who have no clean water, no food. I mean, to think that such a system could be forever just shows you that these people are not thinking straight. And then you have somebody like Joseph Borrell, the so-called foreign minister of the European Union, who says, oh, the EU is a garden and everything outside is a jungle. I mean, that mentality, uh, that colonial spirit uh, is, you know, um, that will be the downfall. Unfortunately, you know, the people of Europe uh, and the United States will be the victims. But, you know, where this will go is very difficult to say, as you can see in the situation in France, in Holland, and soon in Germany. The people are in the street uh, in France. Uh, I just talked to some of my colleagues there, and they're telling me it's not just about the arrogance of the Macron government to impose the pension reform by degree and not even respecting a vote in the parliament. It's not only about the pension age, it's about the future of France. And more and more people you know, are really worried that they're being governed by establishments who do not care about their well-being. And this is a very dangerous situation because if the trust between the governed and those governing is lost completely, you know, that leaves a very open field. It could go the way like it happened in 89 with the GDR. You know, there also you had uh, the population losing the trust into the government and it came to the fall of the wall. But, you know, then people were ill-prepared and uh, the East Germany was completely taken over by the West. And there is now, you know, almost like a new division in Germany between East and West, between those people who go with the narrative of the mass media about Putin, but then many people in the East do not buy that narrative and they feel that they have been betrayed for their life story. So it's very complicated. And at this point, I cannot make a prediction where this will go. All I can say is it's now the time to act and support the proposals which are made by the Schiller Institute because we have turned out to be you know, uh, uh, correct. My late husband in 1971 predicted that this would happen, the, exactly the point where we are at now, because he said if what, what started with Nixon decoupling the dollar from the gold standard and going for floating exchange rate, which was the road to profit maximization and monetarist policies at the expense of the physical economy, he said, and this is now 52 years ago, uh, that we would end up in a new depression, a new war danger, and a new danger of fascism if one would continue on that road. And that's exactly where we are. So we have to go into a new system and we have to mobilize the people in Europe, in the United States, to say, let's go with the Belt and Road Initiative. Let's join hands with the BRICS rather than regarding them as an opponent. I mean, you cannot have the world being divided in two blocks, uh, you know, where everything looks like, you know, that the Ukraine situation uh, is the intention to be repeated in the Indo-Pacific. This could only end up in world war and we have to urgently go in a different direction. Absolutely, and I totally agree. I mean, we are saying in for 30 years, it's not, it's nothing new here. It's not like a crisis of the last, the last two years with Ukraine. Yes, it's much bigger. It's much profound. It's much uh, in root into our conception of the world, into our conception of the future, in our conception of the human being, 
And really, we need to put the human being as the most important value in the world and everything else should be secondary and should be at the service of the development of the economical for all and, and the access to health education. I mean, and I'm, I'm not understanding why you have all these other concepts if it's not providing that uh, value. Well, you know, I have uh, called for an international emergency summit, uh, uh, you know, either by the UN General Assembly, given the fact that what is at stake here concerns all of humanity and therefore the UN General Assembly would be a place uh, for this to be negotiated, uh, or the G20, even if the G20 is not really representative. And if these two institutions are not willing to do it because there are some countries opposing it, then I think it should be a combination of the BRICS plus the SCO and any other combination. But I think you know, we urgently need governments to act together and give a signal to the world that you know, people can calm down because a lot of people are in panic uh, because there are governments who are taking care of the common good. And I can only ask the people who are listening to this interview, don't take the attitude of sitting on the fence and say, let's see where this goes. But you know, we, we need a, a world movement of world citizens. The fact that we are threatened with world war makes every citizen a world citizen at once. So I have called in a slight variation of uh, the famous proletarians of all countries unite, this comes from a man from Trier, and I'm born in the same city, Trier. So I have changed that and have said, let's have a movement of world citizens of all countries unite, because you know we have to find the higher level of the new paradigm where people put the one humanity first. National interest is legitimate, but it must never be in contradiction to the interest of humanity as a whole when everything is at stake. So I'm confident that it can be solved, but I think we need uh, the best people in terms of wisdom, in terms of courage, in terms of being devoted to the common good to come out and act together and make sure that the direction of civilization is going in a good direction. Because right now, I think we are still in, in a mortal danger. Uh, if the Ukraine thing goes in the wrong way, there are now weapons being delivered to Ukraine, which reach into Russia. Uh, the British in particular are encouraging uh, the Ukrainians to retake uh, Crimea. All of these are red lines and sooner or later, this can go completely uh, in, in, you know, in a totally the wrong direction because if Russia has the justified feeling that the existence of Russia is threatened, they have already said that you know that will not accept that you cannot defeat the largest nuclear power i mean russia is ahead of the west in terms of hypersonic missiles and other technologies and russia will not be defeated i mean the idea that you can weaken russia to the point where you have regime change get rid of putin all of these are you know wet dreams of of a degenerate elite in the west they should stop this uh, this idea that you have to destroy Russia and, and um, you know, we have to find a, a diplomatic solution. And, you know, even Zelensky is now hopeful that with the visit of Xi Jinping to Moscow, uh, you know, that there may be another way out. And I think I'm very interested what happens now when uh, Xi Jinping will be for three days in Moscow from Monday to Wednesday. There is the proposal for the Ukrainian 12 uh, principal peace plan and i'm pretty sure that they will relaunch some major initiative and you know people in the west would be well advised to respond to that and not not try to ignore it hey guys thank you so much it was a fantastic interview really um i agree with uh, with what has been said and and we uh, we will keep in touch please keep presence in your uh, in, in, in your uh, as your home if you have any uh, uh, any news any update please let me know and thank you so much to being on the show thank you and and thank me thank you for, for inviting me thank you very much you're welcome Elga. thank you so much 
So that was your show face to face and keep please watching your news on presenza.com and we hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you.